Egypt, home of the Sphinx, land of the pharaohs, Africa's most visited nation. Her ancient monuments seem like a spirit from Egypt's glorious past, lingering in the background of this modern 21st century African city. How can anyone live here and not have visions of eternity? It's no wonder we are all intrigued by its mystery and curious about its history. No nation in the world has been debated as much as she has. Her dates, her language, her secrets, her people. But it's the history which has caused the most curiosity among scholars and visitors alike. It was formed when the crowns of the southern and northern lands, or what is known as Upper and Lower Egypt, merged by conquest under a northern ruler named Nama. This unification created the first dynastic period, or what historians call the Old Kingdom. Nama was succeeded by those of the same origin as he before another dynasty took over. In all, 32 dynasties ruled these lands over thousands of years. This land has been called by many names, but the name the progenitors of this part of the Nile once called it was Kemet, the land of the blacks. It's impossible to describe the sheer size of this pyramid. This is my fifth time in Egypt, and I firmly believe that to understand what Africans did on the Nile all those years ago, one must not just read about it, but be here to experience it. This is Tommy, a local lawyer and all-round businessman. He'll be accompanying I begin a 1300 kilometer journey across this country, covering the mouth of the River Nile to its most southerly point near Sudan. Giza is just south of Cairo, and its proximity to Egypt's capital makes it part of the Greater Cairo area. Cairo was built as a trading city just over a thousand years ago some centuries after the Islamic invasion of Northern Africa. Giza and Cairo have a combined population of nearly 20 million people, all who seem to be on the road today. The pyramids of Giza complex, or Kem, as it was known by the Africans who built it, attracts millions of tourists every year. Egypt as a whole has been the fascination of foreign scholars since the Greeks first sought an education here in the 7th century BCE. Like the word Egypt, pyramid is only a Greek interpretation of what Africans called these structures. For the Kemet U, they were known simply as Mer. 
There are at least nine pyramids in Giza, built by conservative estimates nearly 5,000 years ago, although they're likely to be much older. The three most popular ones were built to honor three generations of Kemet's rulers from the Old Kingdom. Hunum Hufui, or Khufu, was the second of eight rulers from Kemet's fourth dynasty. The word pharaoh is often used to describe the kings of Kemet, but here they refer to them as Herus, the living incarnation of God. This amazing feat of engineering and organization was built as a tomb to house his dead body as his spirit journeyed through the afterlife. It's made up of 2.3 million granite blocks, cut in such a precise manner that it'd be difficult to slip paper through it. The outside was coated in limestone, which has long since gone. It is said that when the Arabs invaded in the 7th century, the limestone was used to build the Cairo Mosque. As the elder of the three, Khufu's Mur is naturally the biggest and the most famous. The next one was built for his son, Hafre, whose pyramid is about 10 feet shorter than that of his father's. There's still some limestone left on it. Built on higher ground, perhaps it was a way to respectfully one up on his father. And it's certainly bigger than that of his son, Menkore. One of the many myths surrounding the pyramids was that they were built by slaves, which couldn't be further from the truth. Kemet's rulers took great pride in the way they treated their workers, and there is ample information about their good working conditions. No, these were construction projects, whose plans, unfortunately, are lost to history. A few yards away, sits the majestic Horem Aket, which translates to Heru on the horizon. Commissioned by Kafre, we see his head resting on the body of a lion. The Greeks marveled when they first saw this and instantly related it to a figure in their mythology. A woman's head, the haunches of a lion and wings of a bird. They call her the Sphinx and it is the same name they gave to Horemarket when they first saw him. This is one of the many mutilated faces of Kemet's monuments. There are several tales of how this came about, some dating back to a group of enslaved whites from Western Asia in the 13th century, and as recently as 1798 with the cannons of Napoleon Bonaparte at the height of the Atlantic enslavement of Africans. While the who may also be lost to history, perhaps we should study the why. Tagging along on Napoleon's memorable visit was Count Constantine de Volney, who wrote of Horror Market. On seeing that head, typically Negro in all its features, I remembered the remarkable passage where Herodotus says, as for me, I judge the Colchians to be a colony of the Egyptians, because like them, they are black with woolly hair. In other words, the ancient Egyptians were true Negroes, of the same type as all native-born Africans. That being so, we can see how their blood mixed for several centuries with that of the Greeks and Romans must have lost the intensity of its original color, while retaining nonetheless the imprint of its original mold. Just think that this race of black men, today our slave and the object of our scorn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, sciences, and even the use of speech. The Great Pyramids are the last of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But Giza was not where pyramid culture 
along the Nile began. It's more like where it peaked, with these three being the largest of 300 or so, which exist across modern-day Egypt and Sudan. To find the origins of pyramid building here, we need to head a few miles south of Giza, along the west bank of the Nile. But first, let's take in the view. Pyramid building along the Nile goes back thousands of years. Over 200 were constructed in Nubia by the Kushite kingdoms which once formed the region and were closely related culturally to those of Kemet. Pyramid-like structures have also been found in West Africa, in Mali, and among the Igbos of Nigeria. But also in the Americas, at the very least, this shows that Africans from Kemet traveled and shared ideas with their kinsmen across the continent, who in turn, perhaps, exported these ideas across the oceans via the currents which existed. This is the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, forerunner to those at Giza and elsewhere. It is the oldest myrrh found in the region, and once the largest stone structure on earth. Built nearly a century before Khufu's, it was the final resting place for Joza, the second ruler of Kemet's third dynasty. It goes 90 feet underground and connects to various other tombs in the area. This was a great achievement for its time, but Jozo was neither the architect nor innovator. That honor lies with one of history's greatest ever minds, Imhotep, poet, multi-genius, and gifted mathematician, author of one of the world's oldest medical texts. It was he who gave us the famous phrase, eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow, we die. Imhotep's achievements went on to impact many latter-day achievers. Hippocrates the Greek, from whom we get the Hippocratic Oath in modern medicine. Albert Einstein, credited with the theory of relativity, and a slew of others were influenced by his work. The reason why the world is mostly unaware of this diminutive African man is symptomatic of the contempt still shown towards Africans and what they achieved along the Nile. There's a museum in his honor at the entrance of the Saqqara complex, but one can only wonder when his statue will stand at the gates of colleges and universities across the continent and around the world. Giza and Saqqara are located some miles away from the once capital of Kemet, Memphis. The name, like many things from this ancient kingdom, was borrowed by the founding fathers of the United States of America and is now more commonly known as the home of Elvis Presley. Saqqara is a vast area filled with tombs to numerous rulers and administrators of Kemet. The best way to see them is on horseback. So I've gone to see my friend okay, Mahmoud.
One-tenth of the pyramids found across modern-day Egypt are here in Saqqara. Not all are well-preserved, but they're just as interesting. It's too late for me to go further in, so for now, let's enjoy the sunset. Friends of mine from London were visiting Saqqara. Mahmoud has invited us all That's to eat with his family. That's older. That's older. That's older. When you do that for one year and then after you food. You see. As we sit and talk, the cool desert breeze, the laughter, and food by the fire reminds us all that beauty is often found in simplicity. The Nile was the lifeline of Kemet, but its beginnings can be found in three nations in Central East Africa, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. Its main tributaries are the White Nile, the Blue Nile, and the Atbara. They each flow out of their respective sources towards the north, where they meet at the Sudanese capital of Khartoum, before continuing down through northern Sudan, into Egypt, and out into the Mediterranean Sea. Like all rivers, the Nile is a highway, which in ancient times brought nourishment for those alongside it, but also knowledge, culture, and religion. So it's no surprise that many of Kemet's now famous monuments are found not too far from its banks. The further south one goes in what is now referred to as Upper Egypt, the closer one gets to the early roots of its great culture. So that's what we're doing, heading south along the Nile to see more of what this great river brought with it from the south. Tommy and I are setting off to the town of Gebel el Ter. We will then spend the night in the city of Minya before continuing south. Kemet is a land of intrigue for many people, not just because of its monuments and rulers. It also influenced the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This shouldn't be a surprise. Modern day Egypt is next door to Israel and is just a sea journey away from Makkah in Saudi Arabia. There are over 700 references to it in the Old Testament alone, nearly 300 in the Hebrew Pentateuch, and on at least four occasions in the Quran. Many figures of Christianity and Judaism supposedly have connections with Kemet. According to the text, Abraham, the patriarch of all three religions, not only lived there, but fathered a son, Ishmael, with a Kemetri woman named Hagar. Ishmael became the patriarch of Islam, whilst Abraham's younger son, Isaac, fathered a son named Jacob, who would be renamed Israel. And then there's Moses, who's said to have been born in Goshen, in what would be Lower Egypt today. He mysteriously floated into the palace of an unknown Kemetri princess and eventually led Hebrew slaves out of the land. The text also says that Jesus and his family fled the plight of King Herod of Judea and settled here for three years. Before long, we arrive in the town of Minya, sat right on the Nile River. It's one of the hidden gems of this country, and I can't wait to see them. Thank you.
The Church of the Virgin Mary in Jebel El Teh is located five kilometers from the eastern bank of the Nile in Minya province. Hewn out of the mountainside, the church overlooks the banks of the Nile from a steep cliff. The church was built in 328 AD by Empress Helena, mother of Constantine, the first Byzantine emperor to convert to Christianity. Its followers believe it was built around a cave that once supposedly sheltered Jesus and his family. It's quite a small church, inhabited mostly by monks until the 19th century. My guide tells me that some restoration was carried out in the 1930s and they removed its original stone roof so they could add a second level. Regardless of one's beliefs, we cannot ignore the beauty that can be found here. Whilst there is no physical evidence that Abraham ever existed, he is the first Jew. It does also hint at this in Galatians 4.24. The Kemetu rulers had every aspect of their rule documented, including their names and reign. Its influence means that many sought to tie fictional stories to justify their existence. So it's not surprising that the mysterious Pharaoh, who supposedly enslaved the Israelites and adopted the young Moses, has no name. Kemetu history makes no mention of the young child even floating in a basket into the palace, nor ever being adopted by the king. Over a thousand years before the Old Testament is said to have been written, Kemet's priesthood had to recite daily 42 confessions to Kemet's goddess of truth and harmony, Ma'at. These confessions not only predate Moses, but are explained in the Book of Acts. If one is to believe the scripture, one must also conclude that the Ten Commandments Moses supposedly brought down from Mount Sinai were originally found within the 42 Confessions. There is equally no evidence of Hebrew people living in Egypt at the time they were supposed to, nor a prime minister named Potiphar or a Hebrew named Joseph. Even monotheism, the acceptance of a one true God, had already been practiced in Kemet at the supposed time Abraham was to have existed. The drive has been long, and the day even longer. Time to rest up in our hotel in the town of Minya, because tomorrow we continue our journey. The plan today is to continue our drive south to perhaps the biggest archaeological area in Egypt, the city of Luxor. On the eastern bank of the Nile, and about 20 kilometers from Minya, will be our last stop before heading south to Luxor. Bani Hassan is a burial area from Kemet's 11th and 12th dynastic periods, or what's known as the Middle Kingdoms. 
Dating back some 4,000 years, these rock-cut tombs were built to house the governors and important leaders from the area. I've been given special permission to view these tombs and a policeman to keep me safe. In the same way we have counties or states today, Kemet was divided into different divisions or gnomes. There were as many as 42, each ruled by a nomarch or governor. 22 in Upper Egypt and 20 in Lower Egypt. The area around Minya, such as Bani Hassan, is part of the 16th Oryx Nome of Upper Egypt. Only four of the 39 tombs are accessible to the public, but I've been given an exclusive VIP tour without the interference of students or tourists. Heti was a nomarch in Middle Egypt during the 11th dynasty. And whilst his body has since been removed from its burial chamber, we can still appreciate the tomb's design. The walls of this tomb show some interesting scenes about everyday life during his reign. On the east wall, restless training and preparing to storm castles and fortresses. Facing the entrance, wild animals hunting in the desert. People fishing, a scene of a statue being sculpted of the deceased and his wife, alongside scenes of funeral rituals. All these activities being presided over by Heti and his wife. His burial chamber was 60 feet underground, built with these primitive tools. It's a marvel the sheer depth of creativity which existed at the time. For around 25 years, Amenemhat held the title of Nomarch of the Oryx Nome, the last to hold that title during the reign of Kemet's 12th dynasty Heru, Sanusret I. Like Hetis, Amenemhat's tomb shows daily life during the period. Agriculture, fishing, carpentry, sandal making, pottery, bows and arrows fighting too. The art of wrestling is a martial art with several essential aspects. Controlling your opponent, throwing him to the ground before killing him. These drawings indicate that wrestling in Kemet was an art form. Most of these movements and grips are the same free wrestling grips known today. The ceiling of the tomb is striking. In each segment, a hieroglyphic inscription runs through the center, flanked by a yellow and red check pattern contained in a rectangle.
The view from up here is immaculate. And I'm not one to pass up an opportunity to take it all in. There's no time to chill. There's a long drive ahead. And the winter days of Egypt are cold and short. Time to get a move on. Luxor is a major city in Upper Egypt. It's my first time going there by road, which I'm looking forward to. At over 400 kilometers, this is one of the longer legs of my journey. Foreigners are a premium in Egypt these days, so we've been given a police escort. It's time to reflect on the first part of this amazing journey as we make our way to the heart of Upper Egypt.